I'm still hooked on the feeling, are you? Thanks for checking out my channel, I'm John Stark from MacMovieGuy.com, and this is my review of Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. This is on Disney Plus now, and it has audio description by Laura Post, I believe. This is one of those films, it's shocking new trend where they feel like crediting nobody at the end of the film, but uh, I do believe it's Laura Post. Um, so I'm going with that. And I'm a blind film critic. That's why I'm talking about audio description, because that's why I'm here, is to talk about it and normalize it for my community. So let's strap in and take a ride with the Guardians. One last time. One last time. Anybody who ever saw Hamilton? <laughs> anyway, um... This is a very rocket-based movie. It really is. Of course, I'd heard that in the reviews. Uh, I waited until Disney Plus to see it, but I knew it was going to. I mean, it's a Marvel project. I've seen every other Marvel project, so and I'm a huge fan of the first two Guardians films. I actually think the third film might be the best. I think it actually takes everything that they've ever set up in the first two films and really ties it into this film and ties it in with Rocket. Rocket is the emotional core. <laughs> Who would have thought that we've come such a long way? And I think that's also what really the film is about, is that we're now at a point uh, where Rocket can be sort of this serious emotional core instead of just like a side character or a sidekick or the goofball or whatever, you know? Like, he's actually... He's actually evolved so much as a character that to put him in this position for the film, uh, even though arguably he spends a lot of time uh, having other people do things for him. I'm trying to do this without spoilers. I'm going to do this without spoilers, by the way. I'm not going to ruin the film for you. So um, he he does spend a lot of time having people do other things for him. Uh, by the end of the film, you get this feeling that uh, there's a very different ra Rocket Raccoon than uh, at the end of the Guardians trilogy than there was at the beginning. And I think that's great. Uh, I love the story arc here, and I love what James Gunn has done with that character and Bradley Cooper. Like, normally the voice work on these characters... There was even a, there was even an I am Groot from Vin Diesel where it actually for the first time felt like he acted that where like he actually like really he was like guys I got this <sighs> I am Groot you know like he just it just like really <laughs> it just really came in because a lot of times I'm just like he's just finding different ways of saying I am Groot and they're just plugging it in I think his. I would love to see a video of Vin Diesel shooting his dialogue for this film. And it's just like, can you say it again? Say it differently. Do it a different way. One more time. A different way. What, uh, do it a different way. I don't think he's actually reacting. I think he's just... He spends a day saying, I am Groot. About 5,000 times. And they pick the ones that they want. <laughs> but this one was actually really effective. There was one that was, I was just like, damn. Damn, dude. I get it. You are Groot. Um... Nobody can deny you of that. Thank you. Uh, it's a it's a great ride. Star Lord is is uh, still trying to figure out life without Gamora. Uh, when we open up on the Guardians, no, she is she's not with them. Uh, they're on nowhere. And we do have Kraglin has a has the most he's ever had to do in a Guardians film. <laughs> I mean, he's playing around with the little whistle uh, arrow that, you know, I just trying to, like, master that skill. Cosmo? I didn't realize Cosmo was going to be used that much in this film either. Cosmo has quite a bit to do and is actually really integral in one scene. <laughs> There's one scene where it's like, if Cosmo doesn't get this right, they all die. <laughs> like, everyone dies. <laughs> so, um... I I really did not expect those two to be used to any sort of great effect, but they're given quite a bit to do here. Um, I I feel like other reviewers don't point that out, and I really want to make sure that you guys know if you're fans of Craglin and Cosmo, 
they're not just there in the background. It's not like they're just like in a scene and they just like walk away and they're like, we're the, we're the guardians we're supposed to forget about. Bye. <laughs> they're there. Um, and, uh, there are, uh, there's some other interesting cameos. There's one that's already been in the guardians film before, but I'm, I won't ruin that for you. Um, so it's not even new, it's not new to Guardians, it's just like, it's a nice, like, hey, look at, look at what's still in, look at what we still got in Guardians. Um, and, uh, so Star-Lord is, he's mopey, he's drinking a lot, Rocket's trying to, you know, hold the group together in the beginning, and, uh, Nebula has come a long way, <laughs> also as a character, she's like sympathetic now she has emotions um drax is great in this uh, i totally understand why Do dave bautista wants to go try and do more serious work because i feel like he's trying to do that right now i feel like he's really trying to bring some stuff out of drax there's some moments where uh his character has just a little bit of an emotional point to make and he really tries to nail that 100%. Like, he really wants to make sure. It's so weird to think to myself that I think Dave Bautista wants to win an Oscar, but I really think he does. I really think this guy's going to put in the work. And a lot of other action stars like him, a lot of people who come out of, like, wrestling and, uh, you know, UFC and stuff like that, they don't, they don't really... I don't think they're, I don't think they're taking that seriously. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the fact that Dwayne Johnson has never been given remotely a role of any sort of dramatic heft uh, is not a great sign for somebody like Dave Batista, but Dave is just, he's putting in the work. Um, and that, that little group, that little grouping along with Mantis, um, Mantis is, Mantis is Mantis. Mantis has... She hasn't had as long to grow because she came in in the second film. So all we've really seen her grow is through the Avengers films, the little Guardians holiday special, and then this. So it's like, how much has she changed really since the second film? Because, you know, from Guardian to Guardian, she's just a little bit more outspoken. Uh, and her dynamic with Drax is just a little bit funnier. Um, she has a, actually a really good partnership with Drax throughout the film that works really well. So, uh, that's nice. And we do eventually get Gamora, don't worry. They didn't close out the Guardians film without Gamora. That would be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> I feel like fans would hate this film if Gamora just never came back. If <laughs> It's just like, I'm gone after Avengers. Um, so yeah, we do have Gamora and some of her, some of the best scenes in this film are between Gamora and Star Lord, because Star Lord is constantly trying to convince Gamora uh, that they were in love. It's like he's trying to bring back memories that Gamora cannot possibly have, because it's not that she forgot them; she's not, she doesn't have amnesia. It's that she was ripped out of a certain place in time before she had ever met Star Lord, and he seems to not really con like conceptually understand that, so he <laughs> keeps trying these things. And there's this one time where she just snaps at him and she says, what is it that's wrong about you that you need me to fix it? You know, like she just yells at him and it was so like emotionally poignant. Like it was saying something about Star-Lord, like, what is it that you need me to fix in you? And I think when Star-Lord hears that, he kind of, that's kind of the moment that flips the switch for him and tells him and puts him on his progress, uh, sort of for the rest of the film. Even as Star-Lord and Gamora's relationship changes, because they spend a little bit more time together on this mission, um, they do, you know, it's still not his Gamora. And he can't change that. He can't go back. Uh, unfortunately, Thanos took that from him. And it would be easy to say, oh, we could just bring that back. We could just snap it and bring it back. And I think that's really interesting because should they ever try to find a way to bring back Black Widow uh, into any of the films, 
in a in a current film, I should say, uh, with Scarlett Johansson, that the same thing would be true of her. It wouldn't. It may not be the Black Widow everybody knows and loves. It could be a very different Black Widow, and Gamora's proof of that is. It's almost wanting somebody back selfishly, um, but uh, you know, for yourself and. Uh, what happens to this person who's sort of ripped out of time. So Gamora is a really interesting character and how she has found her new place in this world is, is interesting as well. Um, we do get Sylvester Stallone. I think it's awesome that James Gunn has chosen to work with Sylvester Stallone. I realize that between the Guardians films and Suicide Squad that uh, he clearly likes the guy and they work well together and I'm excited about where that would go from here you know uh what about James Gunn's continued use of Sylvester Stallone because um I thought he was hilarious as King Shark and he's he's great in this small role that he has in Guardians which is is it's more than an elevated cameo it's not just a cameo um we've also got Adam Warlock which everybody wants to talk about Nicholas Holt playing Adam Warlock a lot of people, I've, I've seen other people who are like, he didn't need to be in this film. Is that true? Um, I don't know. My problem with Adam Warlock is, look, I, I read comics when I could see before I was blind, when I was a little kid, way back in the day. I have very little interaction with Adam Warlock. It's not a character that I have like a deep connection to. I did think he was a good guy. I did think he was a hero. Uh, I didn't get that from Nicholas Holt's performance. And the film doesn't really give him enough chance to grow. Um, however, the way the film uses him is to great effect, I think. I think the way he's used is more representative of the high evolutionary uh, and what he does to things and what he does with people than necessarily like, oh good, we're going to have Adam Warlock joining and he's going to do great things for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I don't know. I don't know what he, he, I don't know that he is. I don't know if he will. I don't know where he will be. Um, especially with Guardians uh, kind of rapping James Gunn's done with the MCU because he's doing the DCEU now. I don't know. Um, but for one film, I thought he made. I thought he made more of an impact actually than Kurt Russell did his ego. Like I liked, uh, I liked his little performance here than I did the whole like, uh, Kurt Russell thing as ego in Volume Two. I was like, oh, oh, well, that's what we're doing here. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for bringing me Kurt Russell so we can do this. Um, it's, it's, he gets to be a little funny, but it's not, it's not, it's not like the great funny. It's not, that's, it's not that either. So be prepared, uh, to debate Adam Warlock with your friends. <laughs> um, some of the other things that, that the high evolutionary is, is doing are just, uh, I, I don't know. James Gunn came out of horror. I think everybody forgets that. Um, you know, back when Disney found a tweet from, like, way back in the day, and or the world did, and they tried to fire him from Guardians for something he did years before they ever hired him for Guardians. Um, it's like, yeah, he came from a very different place. And they picked him for his mind for this franchise. In this film, he's saying goodbye and he's pulling out all the stops. He's pushing that PG-13 rating really hard. There are things that we are okay with seeing done to animals in films that we're not okay seeing done to humans. Um, and there's also the fact that with films, we're often... <sighs> we often allow a lot more violence in films than we will anything else. You know, there's still that, that sort of hypocritical notion of how many people can be decapitated in the film and maintain a PG-13 rating. Meanwhile, oh shit, we said fuck three times. <laughs> you know, like, damn. 
<laughs> Gotta rate that R now. <laughs> and it's just... It's like, what? It doesn't make any sense. There's a, there's a lot of really intense violence here. And if I had a really little... A really small kid... Even described to me... Um, some of it is... You know... Is, is done to these creatures that are like aliens... It's still really kind of disturbing. Um, I, I'll i say out of context, Groot shoots his, his hand through the back of something's head and it comes out their mouth. That's a horror movie trope. <laughs> we see that in horror movies. <laughs> we don't usually see that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, but that's, that's why James Gunn is here, is because he has him... And Sam, Ra Sam Raimi and people like that understand how to do stuff like that and how to make it look cool. And they're figuring out a way how to make it look cool and fall in the PG-13 category. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff here that happens to animals that will make people uncomfortable. And uh, I think that's true. I, I mean, I've, I heard it from other critics, and I agree. I'm not just trying to regurgitate, but I, I do think that there's a lot of um, animal abuse in the film. Uh, admittedly, there's no way any of these are real animals, by the way, but <laughs> there are a lot of animals in this film. And uh, if you're an animal lover, this is going to be a really hard film for you to watch. Uh, a really, really hard film for you to watch. <laughs> if you love animals. <laughs> um... Doing this without spoilers is really fun, by the way. Really interesting. I'm, I'm glad I chose this route. So, uh, yeah, the High Evolutionary, some people complained that he wasn't a great villain. I thought he was his own villain. You know what I'm saying? In this world where we went from sort of Ronin to uh, Ego to the High Evolutionary, with Thanos kind of in the background of the first two films... But he wasn't the primary villain in the first two films. Um, with all that in mind, I think the High Evolutionary is terrifying for a variety of reasons. They also do something with him um, that is, again, very horror movie. movie. The, the skin thing that he's got going on? I was like, what? That is... That is where you look at PG-13 and you think to yourself, there is a 13 there for a reason. <laughs> PG-13 doesn't mean, you know, might be a little tough for my six-year-old, but I think he'll be fine. <laughs> I don't know that your six-year-old will be fine in this film. I really don't. I think your six-year-old would have been fine in the first two. I can't promise that here. There's James Gunn was you know, given keys to the kingdom on his way out the door, and he used it. And he's he ha he's definitely reminding everybody that he came out of the horror film genre, and he's using it to the most effect that he possibly can. There was a lot of talk about is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness technically a horror film because of a lot of the things that happen here. I think that's, there's a valid case to be made here that there are plenty of horror movie tropes in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 as well. So, um, I, I think that's a sa the same question that we need to be having. However, I do have to say I loved this film. I love the soundtrack. I love the fact that they acquire the right kind of music. It's like James Gunn. Uh, James Gunn is a little bit like Edgar Wright with Baby Driver. It's like every song feels perfect for the moment. And you can't beat that. Um... So that really helped. I, I love the flow of the story. I love where it went. I love the characters. I, I, I was terrified of the high evolutionary. <laughs> I didn't mind Adam Warlock. I thought he was a good introduction. He's, he's, it's a little bit overblown to talk about him too much because he's not like the star of the film and he's not a primary hero or villain. He's just in the film. Uh, but he is, the effect to which he's used, I thought, was fine. Um, and it has laughs, and it's sad, and it's action-packed, and it leaves you, much like a volume three that finishes out a trilogy, 
should leave you with optimism that they could do something more with the characters if they wanted to, but they don't necessarily have to. Will we see these characters again? I don't know. I'm going to guess no to some of them. I'm going to guess this is the last film for some of these characters. I don't think we'll ever see them come back, no matter what uh, galaxy threat <laughs> comes. Uh, Dave Bautista has been pretty, uh, pretty confident in saying that he doesn't intend on returning to this role without James Gunn. So unless they somehow convince James Gunn to come back, he has no intention of coming back. So I think this is at least a goodbye to Drax. That doesn't mean he lives or dies. It just means I don't, I don't expect to see Dave Bautista again in a, in a Marvel film. Um, even, even like, even how we're jumping through multiverses, I don't expect them to be like, hey, look, it's Drax. <laughs> I could, I, nothing, none of that. I just, he's done. He's out. Uh, that was, that was a nice farewell and it was a very, uh, very good one for him. The audio description in this is incredible. Um, Laura Post and wherever her team is, because I, they, there's like a end scene, so uh, I guess we didn't, uh, you know, I didn't get, I didn't get anything about her audio description or her team. I just recognized the vo the voice. Uh, it's yeah, it's incredible. I mean, there's so many different things happening throughout the film. Character descriptions are things that uh, they're creatures that have no basis in real life, and that's one of the things I always talk about as being one of the most important things is with fantasy films. When you have it, when you have something that has no basis in in the real world, you really have to go all in on some of these character descriptions. And there are some things here that have no basis in the real world, and we have to know what they are. You can't just tell me, you can't just call something something, and um, and I'm like, oh yeah, that thing, cool. Uh, I have no idea what it looks like because that's not a real thing. But thanks. No, they they go in and they really try to describe what some of these creatures look like. There are some things that Mantis interacts with that are designed to look terrifying and gross. Um, and therefore we get that in detail because it's important. Um, there's also uh, modifications that are done to creatures through the high evolutionary. Uh, and we are told sort of what those are and how that makes them different. There are coupled uh, violent gore moments. There are decapitations in this, which is odd, but because, again, it's one of those things where it's like, if it happens to an animal, we seem to be okay with it. You know, if, if it was a human, you know, if Star-Lord got decapitated in this film, I don't think this film would be page 13. But because of what this film is, um, we are okay with it for some reason. It's very weird. Uh, I'm telling you this film walks a very thin line. Uh, it's a heavy PG-13. PG-15. Because <laughs> 17 is R. It's a PG-15. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a rating that doesn't exist. Um, yeah, there's just, there's some stuff in here that I think, uh, Yes, I got it in the auto description, and I was like, wow, they put that in, okay, we went, we went there, that happened, oh, we did that too, okay, ah, uh, good to know, <laughs> I was just kind of a little bit blown away, um, this is also the first Guardians film I wasn't able to see, so my blindness uh, timed itself to hit between the second and the third film, uh, the second film actually dropped a little bit before I was diagnosed and found out I was losing my vision. And uh, so I just barely got it in under the radar. But um, I got it. <laughs> so uh, I'm pretty familiar with these characters and I love them. And I think this might be my favorite Marvel trilogy in terms of consistency. When you look at the Thor films and the Iron Man films and some of the other film, the other uh, characters that have multiple films in their series, 
I don't think there's a consistency there, but James Gunn really brought that level of consistency. And when I did my video on what is wrong with Disney, because Bob Iger is bitching about it, I said, you need to trust in the creatives. You need to hire the creatives. You need to stop micromanaging them and you need to trust them. What James Gunn did with Guardians of the Galaxy is he took an obscure, yes, they were obscure, uh, to, to, to the, to the wider audience, these people were obscure. To comic book nerds, no. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sure most comic book nerds know who Doop is, but if we made a Doop film, that would be obscure, you know? <laughs> Doop had his own comic book run, so <laughs> I can't really say that he's an obscure comic book character since he had his own comic book series. However, I think we can all agree that if you were to talk to somebody who doesn't read comic books and doesn't understand who that is, that if suddenly there was a Doop movie, you would have a lot of explaining to do as to who that is and why we're watching a movie about him. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, but he, he took this and he ran with it and uh, really made something special out of it. And I'm super grateful, super happy, and... Uh, the audio description on this film, I'm really glad, was just fantastic on so many different levels. It did everything it needed to do. It it conducted it as both a horror film and a sci-fi film. I got narration all over the place. The descriptions were so perfect. Um, and they just really brought out... Because uh, there's so much happening all the time. If you focus on every little thing... You know, like, what is someone wearing? Well, you know what? Around you, you've got this entire world. You've got creatures that don't even look like... You know what I mean? Like, you have to pick what it is to describe in the scene. And you're like, I don't know, he's wearing like a jacket and jeans. Do I need to tell people that? Uh, oh my god, what is that creature? Maybe I should describe that creature over there. <laughs> you know, it's... I feel like they made the right choices. You know, some other blind people may feel like they made have missed out on something but when you really think about what this film is and what you got out of it you got sci-fi audio description and you got horror audio description it's not a period drama <laughs> we i don't need to necessarily know what they're wearing all the time it's not a, it's not a costume do i sometimes get some costume tips sure i do it's not the primary thing. I'm not sitting here wondering, like, what, who is he wearing? Is that Ralph Lauren? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't care. It's, that's not the point. I want to know whose head he just blasted off, you know? Um, anyway, so, I love Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Unabashedly, this is one of my favorite films of the year. Hilariously, coming off of, uh, what is probably the best film of the year so far, I'm following it up with another A grade. Because I'm giving Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 an A. I haven't been giving a lot of A's this year. And I gave two back-to-back because -back I just reviewed Oppenheimer yesterday. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, I'm reviewing another Chris Pratt thing next. Because I know I'm going to be doing Super Mario Brothers movie as my next review. So we'll see if we can make three A's this year. <laughs> we'll see if Chris Pratt can get another A out of me. Um... But uh, I really enjoyed how this film left things. And I'm very optimistic about the future. And I think we'll see at least someone from this film again. So, anyway. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Audio description is so important. And I'm here to talk about it. And remind people, remind Hollywood that blind people watch movies too. Because we do. There's, there are these communities online. And not everybody's willing to put themselves in front of a camera and talk about a movie for 20 minutes. So, I am. That's why I got a film degree. So, uh, if you like and subscribe to me, uh, I will continue to do it and continue to try to further this medium so that we can get audio description on more films and we can get better audio description that isn't consistently broken inside of movie theaters. Because that's why I stay home a lot. Anyway, thanks for watching. <laughs> I have a website, MacTheMovieGuy.com. You can go to Twitter, Instagram, or Threads and follow me at MacTheMovieGuy. I'm not calling it X. I'm not doing it. Um, you can go to Audio Description Project, adp.acb.org, and you can see what has audio description and where you can watch it, and you can go to theadna.org. That's the theadna.org, 
and you can look up Laura Post and see what else she has done narration for. That's it. I will leave you with that, review something else, and see you guys on the other side. Because I'm hooked on a feeling.